Hi, thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion about grief and loss during the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Lucy Baker and I'm the Senior Communications Manager here at Guilford Press. I'm so pleased to be here today with Dr. Firma Walsh, Professor Emerita at the University of Chicago and co-founder and co-director of the Chicago Center for Family Health. She is the author of several books, including Strengthening Family Resilience, third edition. Welcome, Dr. Walsh. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's a time right now today that I'm speaking with you. Uh, we are reaching 100,000 deaths in the United States, and it's hard for us to even imagine the losses that, that are experienced by families and loved ones by communities, and really as our whole nation and the rest of the world at this time. So it's important that we think about these losses and how we can help ourselves and one another cope and heal and go through this time. First, let's look at what is grief. Um, it's often thought of a set of stages or steps that we move through and we get to the other side of it, but it's actually more like this tangled ball of emotions. Uh, and often within a family and within a community and within a nation, uh, there are many different feelings that are emerging at the same time, which makes it all the more difficult uh, for each of us uh, to attend to our own grief and also uh, to be attentive to one another. There are many losses in this time of pandemic. Most critical is the complicated death of a loved one. It could be a significant relationship that is hardest to grieve, and it could be a role in the family, such as the matriarch or the breadwinner, or a role in our community, those on the front lines, the healthcare workers, uh, the fire and police, those who are keeping things going to protect all of us. It's also complicated because it's sudden, it's unexpected. People were healthy, or they might have been living with chronic conditions, but not expected to die. And there's often, too often, extreme suffering toward the end. And I think hardest for loved ones is being unable to be at the bedside in person although we're finding ways, at least through technology, uh, to say those goodbyes, not as we would wish, or to hold funeral rites and burial ceremonies uh, that are gathering those who are important to share that grief. There are other losses at this time of physical contact that are very hard for families, a uh, loss of kin, friends, community, a sense of loneliness and isolation, a sense of yearning, missing people, and feeling disconnected. There's also the loss of financial security, of job and career prospects, with a lot of confusion, uncertainty about what's ahead. I think very painful for so many people are the loss of hopes and dreams, especially for young people just coming out of high school, coming out of college, who have had their hopes and plans for their future, uh, for a career, for relationships, for starting a family, and everything seems upended right now. I think what we often feel as a sense of confusion or being unmoored is a loss of a sense of normalcy. We talk about the old normal and the new normal, but we're not even sure what that new normal is or what it will be tomorrow or in six months or in a year. So there's a loss of predictability, of safety, trust, control of our lives, a loss of freedoms with restrictions and lockdowns. So there is this sense of being unmoored uh, and the sense of cognitive confusion. Losses impact the whole family. They affect all family members, their relationships, and family functioning. Ongoing stressors compound that distress. 
But on the other side, the family response, the ways that family members rally together, support healing and adaptation for all members and their bonds. So what's very important right now is to foster mutual support and collaboration through these hard times. There are some things that are unhelpful and in coping. One of these is our uh, society's myth of the rugged individual. And this is kind of uh, aligned with this macho image of self-reliance and the shame in needing help, maybe the shame in wearing a mask or in feeling like we're vulnerable, that there's a misconception that strength means invulnerability. It won't happen to me or the people I care about, and I'm just going to tough it out. What we see is, uh, as many people have said, is the virus is everywhere, and it doesn't distinguish your political or your personal beliefs. It is harmful. And we all have to see that we are in this together. We need and depend on each other. And that vulnerability is human. It's part of the human condition. So it's helpful to realize that our own distress and distress of others is normal in these tough and abnormal times. And that it takes strength to share painful feelings. It's also important then to think about resilience as nurtured through relationships. So thinking about our own and our loved one's relational resource, who can help? We think about our kin and social network. We think about some that are good with emotional support, maybe not so good with the practical side. Others that we can turn to for practical support at this time. We also think about who inspires us, and maybe from our family histories, the stories of past adversity and the resilience that was shown that got them through those times. Another faulty expectation is that there's one right way for normal grief, uh, or that there are these progressive stages of grief, and then we'll just be on the other side. What in truth happens and is supported by research is that there are many varied ways to grieve. There are individual, cultural, and developmental differences in this. So that in our couple relationships, in families, we need to respect these many different ways and the different pacing. Some may be coming along more quickly. Others, for others, it may surface a little later. And we need to help children express their grief and their concerns. So grief processes are going to ebb and flow over time, especially with ongoing uncertainty. So I like to think not of stages of grief, but various facets of grief, like a gemstone that we can turn over and that various ones are going to come to the surface at different times. And the very strong or intense feelings may resurface at anniversaries, maybe at Mother's or Father's Day, or at moments when we most miss our loved ones. And that healing is gradual as we adapt and over time integrate those losses. Another unhelpful myth is this myth of closure, that we're just going to get over it and put it behind you, that there's gonna be something that will happen early on that we can kind of wrap it up and feel a lot better. Yes, we may be able to find certain things that are helpful as we move along, but we don't just put it behind us. Also, this earlier idea that you should detach from losses, let go of what matters, uh, is also not helpful. And it's very much like the faulty view of resilience, we hear a lot about resilience uh, these days, and it's this idea that you just bounce back. Uh, and it's a, a little bit like the Energizer Bunny, you just keep going. What is helpful is to understand that grieving and recovery processes take time, and that we can expect suffering, struggle, and setbacks. And we need to 
to be compassionate with ourselves and each other during those hard times. So healing and resilience really involves struggling well. Meaning making and learning from our experience, revising hopes and dreams that have been dashed, and integrating the experience into the chapters of our lives. Also important to realize that death ends a life, but not a relationship. So what's important is to think of helpful ways to continue bonds with loved ones who are lost, find ways to honor and sustain connections through memorial gatherings that may occur later. Many are finding ways creatively to stream them. Uh, but those are important for us to communally share and heal. Internet connections, remembrances, websites um, that are important for those who are at a distance. Maybe not only now we live in families spread out across the country and around the globe. People can't often be at the bedside or with others who are grieving. So we need to find ways that we do this uh, to be inclusive. Memories, sharing stories, photos, get out that photo album that we've always meant to put together. Uh, keepsakes. Uh, I love the word keepsakes. Uh, I like scarves very much. And it's a, it's a remembrance of my mother who passed a scarf to me before she died. And uh, when I wear them, I think of her. We keep memories and honors of our loved ones alive through deeds and legacies. How we want to honor the best in that person, the best of their intentions, even though they may not always have been able to live up to their best. And we often find new purpose that comes out of this struggle and out of the grief process, where we want to help or be benefiting others who may be struggling or to prevent others from going through the kind of tragic loss that we have. Spiritual connections are also very important. Uh, many people in cultures around the world uh, have a much more immediate sense of being in touch, being in contact, with those who are deceased. It may be through belief in an afterlife and that there will be reuniting at some time in the future. But even so, there's a sense that we talk to our loved ones. I talk to my mother, even though she's been gone a long time. Um, and so it's important to realize the many ways that we can honor and keep continuing those bonds. As we go forward, there are many different paths. And oftentimes, uh, we are, I think, at this, uh, where the road has abruptly ended. Uh, this pandemic came out of the blue. We've never experienced in our lifetimes anything like it. We don't know how to go forward. And I think part of the reason that loved ones and friends is that we help each other in that moving forward process. But it's not going to be a straight line. Uh, it's more likely going to be this winding road where you can't quite see around the bend. It's definitely going to be a bumpy road. And let's hope uh, that you're not going to be careening around a curve. So what is resilience in response to loss? Resilience is really the human capacity to overcome adversity. It involves coping, adapting, and positive growth. That's what I like best about the concept. And the research over the last three decades uh, really gives us good grounding uh, for understanding that it's more than coping. It's more than adapting. It's more than just surviving and getting through. But that people report that through that struggle, they became stronger. They tapped into resources within themselves and in the relationships that maybe they hadn't accessed before. And they became more resourceful and better able to meet the challenges ahead. 
So instead of this notion of bouncing back, because we don't know that we can go back, maybe it's about bouncing forward into an unknown future to live and love fully. And it's supported by our relational bonds, our community connections, our cultural and spiritual resources. What's hard here is that we don't just do this little package of grief work, but we're always having to go back and forth between attending to our grief and facing the challenges that have come up in light of this loss, coping with the multi-stress demands. What's unhelpful is to say or believe I should be able to manage it all and I don't want to burden others or even that shame about needing to tell others you need help. But all of this leads to burnout. What's helpful is to reach out for what you need, pay it back. We're independent, not just independent, but interdependent. And we may be paying it forward in the ways that we want to help or to protect others around us. Also, to think about teamwork rather than mom can handle it all, uh, or dad will take care of this, or our leaders are going to fix it, but it's a teamwork where we pull together. And in caregiving, we think of it as a caregiving team. What's most important here, too, is as we are attending to what needs to be done, we have to help each other make time and space for grieving and self-care. How can we support those among us who are struggling hard? One is that uh, in our country particularly, we think of ourselves as problem solvers. And Americans have always had discomfort with the idea of loss and grief. And we can't fix it. We can't bring back loved ones. And we have to avoid platitudes or homilies, like God never gives you more than you can hold. And avoid saying things like, well, at least it wasn't something that was worse. Because to everyone who is grieving a loss, we have to respect and understand the depth of their grief. We can helpful, be helpful by being at their side, listening, comforting, supporting, keeping in touch. Let's not forget the telephone cards and letters, often helpful information, coping strategies, while not pushing people too fast. Reach out to connect and this keeping in touch. For those who are in deep distress, it's very important to seek professional grief counseling if needed. How do we help kids with loss, grief, and uncertainty? First is open communication, be honest, truthful. It's not just going to be one communication, but opening the door to many communications, realizing that young children may communicate through their behavior, and we need to be watching and noticing signs of up upset as we comfort and support them. And with them, too, sharing active coping strategies so they're part of the helping team. Creative connections across distances for those who are isolated and alone, for grandparents who can't see their grandchildren. Uh, I love this. This is a colleague, dear friend, who's given me permission to show how she and her granddaughter um, play together and make art together. Uh, her granddaughter says here, uh, Granny, will you make my favorite animal, it's a flamingo, with, and with hearts. And so this is the drawing uh, that she made and showed her granddaughter. And then in turn, she said, okay, now I want you to make a photo for me. So we have to be creative in our transactions uh, with the loved ones who are at a distance. Deepening connections with elders who may be isolated and we worry about them as well. Sharing stories and memories, as I've mentioned. But here's something that is an opportunity now that we have the time 
that too often we don't in our hectic, overscheduled lives. To learn about, learn more about family history, even our kids can interview their grandparents and record their life stories. You know, asking questions like, how did grandma and grandpa fall in love? Asking questions about hard times that they faced in their lives, and what they learned out of that and how they got through that. How do we keep a positive outlook or hope? Unhelpful is this idea of constant cheer or false hopes. What's helpful is acknowledging loss, the grief and the impact, rekindling or reorienting hope. What can we hope for now? Mastering the art of the possible. This is to me most important. To help focus on what you can control. Taking an active initiative, persevering, persisting. Accepting what can't be changed, what's beyond control. Doesn't mean we like it. And tolerating the uncertainty that we're going to be facing for many months ahead in the future. Finding humor in the midst of these tough times is really important. So I love these cartoons of the cat, of course, uh, who is urged to try something new. Uh, and the dog, uh, like my dog, uh, who is going to make it up to the top of those uh, stairs, but it may take a much longer time. Drawing on spiritual resources is very important whether it's transcendent values and practices or through religion or outside religion in our own deeper uh, spiritual ways. Because they foster meaning, wholeness, harmony, a sense of purpose, and a deep connection within ourselves and others. So we can find when we're feeling lost, spiritual moorings and inspiration from a faith community or belief in a higher power through prayer and meditation, meaningful rituals with our family members, nature, creative arts and music, and through our compassion and generosity to help others. Maybe through prayer, uh, lighting candles for loved ones, being out in nature, if we can't get out too far, what now we see in the blossoming of spring and early summer, are these new shoots, these new plants coming up that remind us that no, wherever we are, the sun is setting every day and the plants are coming out of the ground. It helps us get a larger vision of our connection and hope for the future. Finally, our bonds with companion animals and the importance of revitalizing our mind, our body and our spirit, finding ways to have enjoyment with our family and friends, and make time for respite and self-care. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope this has been helpful to you.